a, a solid team that can then help me scale up. Those are the key elements that people, uh, VCs look at before they give you a Series A round. And it takes a lot of money and time and commitment to get to that point. Um, angel money, seed money is fine, but that's not gonna solve the problem. So to truly help an entrepreneur, I thought I need to help them sustain it up to Series A. Um, the second thing I realized was VCs look at 300 uh, IMs, pick about 30 after doing a lot of due diligence and fund those 30 entrepreneurs. Of course, they've answered all the questions. Is the idea feasible? Is there a market opportunity? Is there competition that can validate it? Um, is your team good? Do you have the right credentials? Uh, what kind of money do you need? What, uh, what is your scaling options? And of course, the most important question, is this an exit opportunity for me as a VC? And those 30 kind of cut that, uh, you know, cut, uh, cut to the chase, made sure that they answered all those questions right. But the funny thing is out of the 30, only two succeed. And that also with a lot of finagling. Eight will be floundering after the second year. And 20 of them actually shut shop. Why do they shut shop if they had all the answers? I realized that they shut shop because the, the path to getting to that comfortable, stable situation is not as simple as it seems. The money that they raise or they think they need to raise to get to that point is never enough. And then by the time they have to raise it, they've run out of money and they don't have the wherewithal to sustain to continue to raise further money. And finally, they all just give up or uh, as I've seen in India, their parents say, come home, enough of this entrepreneurship. Why don't you give up and take a good job in Wipro? <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, or the wife says, you know, you never come home on time, so I think you should give up. Your children never see you. So somehow the reasons are innumerable, and unlike the Silicon Valley where entrepreneurship is now a honed science, I think in India it's still, people are still learning what entrepreneurship really means. It means staying the course. It means seeing it till the end and at any cost. And, but that will come in time. But in the meantime, I was looking at what I can do to help. So we decided that we would take a participative role we would invest up to Series A, whatever it takes, so that the entrepreneur would not go searching for money, but rather spend their time and attention on um, focusing on the business they had to do. We would help them with sales and marketing because if they understand what the customer needs, the, then the product that they build or the service they're offering actually meets the market needs, and they don't have to spend all their money before they discover that. And of course, we would participate when, uh, with them on a day-to-day -day basis so that you know, if they face issues, which they will inevitably, they're not frightened or worried, but they, can, they know we're with, it, with them in the game. And uh, hopefully that will take them forward. So I started this. We've invested in four companies. Happy to say they've all still around three and a half years old. And uh, two of them are now raising Series A. And so I think the model is being validated. A um, lot of people in the community are uh, agreeing and supporting us now. And I hope to try to replicate this and do a few more. Um, but um, to wrap up, I've been told I have to check the timer. The last slide was uh, passion. Uh, it does, I'll say it. Uh, just know what you want, right? Go after it and want what you know. You have to stay the course. Thank you. I'll just take one minute. I think I uh, kind of misguided probably saying that, you know, you cannot become entrepreneurs, you have to work for someone. I think I didn't mean that. Mean that. Let me just clarify what I meant. Um, because, you know, I, I, I wanted to, you know, clarify this. <laughs> no, no. This advice is primarily for engineers. You know, you finish four years of engineers, right? Eng engineering degree you finish. But I ask a question to all the engineers who are here. You know, when you're in the family, you know, you are not funding your education unlike the West. You are funding the education through parents' money. So you are spending your money through your parents' money. You are not an asset to the family or a liability. So if you want to move from a liability to an asset mode, you better work for someone, clean that off, and then become an entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all these stories taught us one thing in common. I want everyone to repeat it. If there is a will, yes, and I'm so sure that these stories definitely added more more wings to our dreams and passion. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a huge round of applause to these wonderful personalities over here. And next we have the Q&A session. And over to Ms. Parveen Hafiz, the Managing Director of Sunrise Hospital. 
The Sunrise Hospitals Group has state-of-the-art facilities and equipments with all super-speciality departments catering to meet patients' needs under one roof. She plays a pivotal role in organizing the surgery camps absolutely free for economically weaker sessions of the people from the day of its inception in the year 2005. She is also the chief coordinator for Center for Advanced Gynec Endoscopy, recognized by FOGSI. The center that has trained more than 2,000 doctors from all over the world in the areas of laparoscopy and modern gynecology in the short span of 17 years. So may I welcome Ms. Parveen Hafiz to... Good afternoon, everybody. We had such wonderful speakers here. I'm sure we can, it can, you can give them one more big applause because they just spoke from their heart. Time is short, so I'll make it very quick. Uh, the first question is to Dr. Dakshani. What are the challenges you faced in a manufacturing business? I'm sure that there, have, there must be lots, but the most important one. You must have noticed even before she finished the question, I was going to grab the mic. <laughs> Every manufacturer doesn't want to see another manufacturer. That's the greatest challenge. <laughs> I would also request if there are any questions in the audience. audience yes. Uh, would yes. You want to yeah, there's another mic. The question is to... Uh, yeah, good afternoon. My question is to Hemalata, ma'am, uh, <coughs> regarding your bikes. Uh, you said you've sold... Uh, around 20,000 bikes to villages in Tamil Nadu. I have lived in a village in Tamil Nadu for three years and I know the, elec the electricity conditions there. Your supply is very low. So how have you dealt with this and how are the villagers dealing with this problem? You can use this, you can use this one. See, that is what even I thought. But you know in villages, people will not have a toilet but they will have a charging point. They will have a mobile phone. <laughs> Serious, you know, it's nothing to laugh. I'm not uh, ridiculing. This is what I found. Sometimes we just assume that there's nothing, you know, and they will somehow find. And it's one of the re uh, uh, villages when I went through my guide and check out, because I know that chronic village, from the government electric line, they are drawing a line and they are charging. <laughs> How they do it is up to them, you know. So I sometimes, you know, it's very disruptive, very creatively they do it. But I think that's not the solution. Okay, the solution is really to go into solar charging and other ways of doing it, and we are also working on it. Once we have a critical volume, we should be able to, you know, bring the cost. You know, my dream is to actually bring the cycle to double nine, double nine price. Today we are not able to do it. Our pricing is still about twenty thousand rupees. I want to bring it out. Once it's affordable, then people can find different ways to charge. Yeah. So we have a company mm -hmm. that we funded that uh, found a way to uh, generate electricity. Uh, by walking, so it's, a, the, it's a sole mm. that you put inside your shoe, mm. and they did it so that you can charge your phone. Mm. So I'm not sure you can charge your bike, <laughs> but the bigger dilemma that quickly occurred to me was if they're going to walk to charge the battery, why are they using your bike? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, any more questions? I think there's something uh, which uh, I would want to ask uh, Durga Das. You have touched all main points of entrepreneurship, <coughs> right? You had spoken about, you spoke about uh, passion, commitment, everything. What keeps you going? What is the major or the main aspect which keeps you going to look forward to tomorrow? Because we need to, but daily morning, I, uh, I said it's not very easy. All of us, we go through a lot of emotional ups and downs. So something sparking has to be there for us to give out the best. I, I think you can't let money drive you. You have to do what is fun. If you enjoy what you do, the rest will follow. Um, I've never done anything because I needed the money. Um, of course, it started that way, as I told you, but uh, eventually what I had to do also was something that was close to my heart, which was playing cricket or whatever, right? So I think uh, finding something that you enjoy doing every moment Keep the so that you're no, no longer working, you're actually enjoying yourself, you're playing a game, is very important. Yeah, I think that's a very pertinent point. I would like to share a small uh, joke. An old man went to a barber shop. Okay, he had only four strands of hair. So he went and that, that barber is actually very famous and he was a little bit uh, irritated. So he just looked at the old man and said, do you want to cut it or count it? Okay, so that the old man said, color it. 
so that is life you know when you take it with joy and fun anything is possible <laughs> there's something else which i would there was uh, uh, anisha i'll just get back to you there one someone went to an african country way back he wanted to start a business in footwear and i think no one was using footwear at that time so the question is is it a major market see no one is wearing a footwear so it is huge a market or there will not be any opportunity so i think an entrepreneur would always look at it in the other way saying that there's no one wearing it so i have 100% market there anisha over to you uh, ladies i really have to say this from yesterday i've been you know jumping sessions and you know just uh, seeing where you know i can actually sit and listen to the entire session i have to say this was the best oh. session it was, it was it was simply beautiful i am so happy that i didn't miss it the entire you know that 45 minutes or one hour that we sat i was rooted and i you know every statement i actually listened to it it was simply beautiful thank you i'm i think i'm saying this on behalf of yeah. everybody here thank you and i want question to durga um, you know when you when you said that in school uh, you had to leave school and then you had to actually uh, you didn't leave school but after school you started uh, a venture Uh, do you think entrepreneurs are born because of these circumstances that throw you into these very difficult uh, positions and then you know it's like <coughs> jumping into the swimming pool and then learning to swim uh, do you think that is what really creates entrepreneurship or i i i i'm from a, f- a business family i i grew up in a business environment i didn't do what my my uh, parents you know my uh, for 100 plus years they were in one business i did something totally different and what i realized my experience was the the uh, the initial few years was so hard you were you know that jumping into the pool and learning to swim it, it was extremely hard everything you learned the hard way yeah. so sometimes i think you know when you said that uh, the circumstances just created the person you are do you agree to that um i think um, entrepreneurs are not made i think entrepreneurship is already inside all of us it's all the qualities that you need to be an, a good entrepreneur a successful one exists in every one of us um i think sometimes you are motivated to discover that sometimes you're forced to discover that it doesn't matter which path you take right um but the point is you're discovering yourself and as you discover yourself you will become you will find that entrepreneur in you thank you i think uh, any more one more question or uh one uh, question to hemlata any take home message for the entrepreneurs in the audience in a nutshell just some some strong point which you want to really emphasize um, on one message that i would like to tell to all entrepreneurs is that you know when you write a business plan revisit your business plan every quarter just don't write and sit on it i mean just forget it just because you'll have new learnings document it see th- that's what something i found in india that you know we don't write okay but the ladies we are better off men particularly the young children don't want to write you know and they think it's something you know it's very uh, not relevant for the uh, in- after they study engineering they don't want to touch the paper you know to write only you sit and write you know you, you, you know i've been taught you write one time it is reading 10 times you know so it is always that when you write when you document it you can always go back so i think i would always suggest entrepreneurs that if you are having a business plan or whatever you are doing an ideating stage or idea something document and update it every quarter and put it in your calendar and ensure that you sit and do it and i think that's one thing the second thing is always uh, i would say that time commitment you know because i think this is where i'm so blessed because i was in singapore so i got u- used to the time commitment so if it's 9 o'clock it's 9 o'clock there's no 92 it's 99 <laughs> so that is something is very important i think thank you thank you very much Thank you so much and as a token of love and respect we have small momento and to give away the momento may i welcome mr deepak aswani the managing director of lakshman das group we giving the momentos to the speakers to mrs 
Dakshayani. I know what the mementos are. <coughs> These are spices of Kerala. And I don't know how much more spicy we can make you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A huge round of applause to Mrs. Dakshayani. Next, we're giving to Ms. Durga Das. To Mrs. Hemlada. <laughs> Last but not, not the least to our moderators, to Mrs. Jyoti Ashwani. And to Ms. Parveen Hafiz. Once again, let's give a huge round of applause to these wonderful personalities. I would like to thank Dr. Dakshayani, Durga Daj, and Ms. Hema for the fantastic session because they spoke from the heart. I, I'm sure that you all agree with it, just like Anisha said. And also like to thank the audience for your patient hearing, even though it's after lunchtime. Thank you very much and God bless you all. So battery or cost is, so what did we do? We actually innovated here and we tried to extend the life of the lead acid batteries. So that has really helped us even to save the company because the whole industry suffered by, you know, lack of poor battery supply in India. You know, on one side, we, we all grumble. We said that China means low quality. China means, you know, they dump all the, uh, you know, uh, low quality products in India. I think all these are nonsense, actually, frankly speaking. Go and, I live in China for three months. The kind of progress that they have made is amazing progress, okay? But they're very systematic, they're disciplined, and they want to get it done. Last slide, okay? And then uh, just concluding two slides. One is about the Gen Y problem, okay? I just wanted to sum it up saying that one advice I want to give you is follow and heart your mind, okay? You saw yesterday, you know, Madhuri Dikshit's husband, Dr. Nene, was speaking. He became a doctor because, you know, his father, mother said so. Actually, he would have been a much, much better, you know, entrepreneur, I thought, you know. So it's, 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 you know, just follow your dream. And if your parents are very keen or insisting that you have to do something, you go and, uh, uh, you know, get relevant statistics to prove and fight and do what you want. So I think that's where the skill is, yeah. And uh, the last point is that comfort, and I already told about it, is that when you decomfort yourself, discomfort yourself, your growth is much better. And then uh, there's other myth that, you know, now there's a lot of college students coming in and they want to become entrepreneurs. I was just, sometimes I laugh to myself, you know, because you cannot become an entrepreneur just out of college. If you want to become an entrepreneur, either you should be the son of Ratan Tata or you should actually, uh, you know, be inheriting a family business or something like that. I'm dead serious about it. You don't have experience, you don't have network, you don't have connections, you don't know how the market works and how can you become an entrepreneur? So just go work for someone for two years, get the experience, get the relevant market know-how, and then you figure out what you do. So two years, you must work for somebody else. That's the advice I give it to all the people. And without that, you will be, you know, just like a, you know, but you will not do anything. Yeah? And then final words, I think in all my of mentors, I just say that if you take one step that's going about doing good for society, believe me, the divine takes nine steps to guide you through. Okay? And second is that, Never compromise in your ventures, your smile, sleep, and silence for anybody at any time. Not worth it. Yeah? And lastly, in all our ventures, you know, all are one. Let me tell you why it is very, very important. I went to one of my friend's place recently, and this found that, you know, there was a small girl in the uh, house giving tea and coffee. I was shocked. I said, she should be going to school. I called my friend. I told her I want her, saying that this is not a good practice. Otherwise, I'll cut off your friendship. She was very alarmed, but I just said so. You know, that is not right, isn't it? So we have to be, we have to treat all as one. And I think that's what my journey is about. I'll be staying for some more time. I'm catching a train at about 4 o'clock. So if anybody wants to talk to you, uh, me, you can talk to me later, okay? Thank you so much. And I thank Taikon for this opportunity. Thanks. 
And our next speaker of the session is Ms. Durga Das, the founder and managing partner of Dasta. Ms. Durga Das is the founder and managing partner of Dasta. She created Dasta as a vehicle to generate a new model of investing, enabling first entrant entrepreneurs to raise money and build expertise, leading them towards additional future funding or buyout. May I invite Ms. Durga Das for the session? Daksha and Hema spoke. I'm not quite sure if I should even open this piece of paper. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Daksha always overwhelmed me even when I was playing cricket with her. She was the most uh, amazing cricketer to play with and she was a great leader. Uh, she was a very good medium pacer, by the way. I know my thigh nose has a lot of marks left over. Um, and Hema, my God, i still catching my breath. I <laughs> promise to buy an electric bike before I meet you again. Um, there are a couple of things I agreed with them, a couple of things I'm not sure I disagree, but sometimes life isn't exactly the way it's laid out. Uh, for example, Hema just mentioned that you know it's, a, uh, it's essential to go and find a job, work, get the experience that's necessary before becoming an entrepreneur. Sometimes life doesn't give you that choice, <laughs> then what do you do? Uh, so I'm, I have a few slides, those are just some key attributes of an entrepreneur. Or maybe you should press this now that you're practiced pressing it. <laughs> and you can go at any time, any time you want. Uh, there's some eight slides. Um, but those are not for you to look at. Uh, they're just to kind of uh, you know, take you along this journey that I'm going to share with you, which is just my journey. Um, I don't think I ever was an entrepreneur. I never thought I would be one. Uh, I didn't have Daksha's uh, confidence or Hema's uh, dedication and commitment. I just happened to be a young kid born in a very conservative uh, South Indian family and um, was very quiet by nature and didn't speak very much. But one day, uh, life kind of changed. Uh, my father had an accident. Uh, in a couple of years, we lost all our money. Uh, we sold all our jewelry. We were on the streets. We couldn't pay our school fees. And I guess I decided at that time that I didn't need to go to school because that was a good option. Uh, we didn't have the money, so I suggested it to my father, who of course told me that that was not an option. But uh, there was a dilemma. If we can't pay the school fees and I still have to go, uh, what was I going to do? So I was coming back home uh, and uh, there was a timber merchant uh, on, on my way home from school and I sent the gardener. We lived in a fairly big house. We didn't have money, but it was still the house. And we had lots of trees. And um, I was uh, 11 or 12 years old then. So I sent the gardener. The uh, gardener went and brought this timber merchant. And I s pointed a few trees to him and said, why don't you cut it and give me some money? And sorry, there was someone in the audience who said not to cut trees. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, but I had no choice at that time. So we cut a couple of trees, and I went and paid the school fees. And I said, oh, OK, maybe there is something I can do. Um, so I went to my father and I told him that I will wait, work for two years, become 18, do all of those nice things and then become an entrepreneur. And he turned around and he said, why wait, why not now? By which time, uh, you know, I was about 13 and a half, 14 years old and uh, I was playing cricket. I started playing cricket with Daksh when I was about 10 years old. And that was my first uh, exposure to going outside my home and it gave me an opportunity to actually build some level of confidence and um, it gave me the opportunity to travel like she did as well and the only thing I knew at that time was cricket I wasn't a great student I was just going to school because I had to and um, I thought about it and it was just one of those times you know opportunities just come to you you have to have an open mind to kind of grab it and you know, see it more clearly inside your mind's eye I figured that the only thing I could do was to involve myself somehow with sport. So I had a coach who had a sports shop, and um, I went to his shop. There were lots of stuff lying at the top of his shop, which were not sold for a while, I guess, that they had cobwebs. So I suggested to him that he would give me some of those goods, and that I would sell them and then in turn pay him back. So he very kindly pulled out the ones that were collecting cobwebs, gave me about 50,000 rupees worth of material. And I started a sports shop called DD Sports. My nickname in cricket was DD. And it started on the Besinaga Beach in Chennai. And I ran it after school. And uh, 
the funny thing was um, when you take, the, and I think one of them mentioned it, when you take that first step, there are many people who take steps towards you. There were people I knew from around the city who would cross 20 sports shops on their way and come after 6 o'clock to meet me to buy from my shop. And those were the, that was the kindness of people that helped me run that business. It helped me pay, uh, put the food on the table, pay our school fees, take care of my dad's health. And that's how my entrepreneurial journey started. Of course, I still didn't believe I was an entrepreneur. I was just doing this for survival. This was not the be all and end all. I expected in my naivete as a young girl that this was all for a limited period of time and I would play cricket, I would become a lawyer, I would go to England, practice, and of course, the ultimate goal was to come back and become the Prime Minister of India. <laughs> Which is true, it was really a dream of mine. Uh, of course, it got waylaid. I'll have to speak to Modi about that. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so that's how it started. Um, once you open your mind up to opportunity, then everything that comes by, you start grabbing. Uh, Cadbury came by my store once and said, why don't you're on the beach? Why don't you start an ice cream parlor? So I started one. And then I was also playing the amateur golf circuit at that time. As you can see, I didn't study very much. I played a lot. So I was playing golf in Uti, uh, near Coimbatore. And a very good uh, uh, gentleman of the game. And I played pretty good golf. Uh, and he, I turned to him and I said uh, at, the, at the end of a game that there was an opportunity to build an advertising agency for his group. And I was looking for an opportunity to expand beyond these little businesses that I was running and to build something more concrete, thinking that would provide me to get, kind of jump to the next stage. Uh, Mr. Raj Gopal was his name of Lakshmi Mills. <clears throat> he turned to me and he, again, one of those moments, you know, how people's kindness touch you. And he said, um, why don't you start it and I'll give the business to you. And the next thing I knew, I put together a campaign, went to him. He gave me 50 lakhs, and in 1987, my first year of college, I started an ad agency. I didn't know any of the businesses I started. Uh, I didn't even know them while I was doing them. But the one thing I did know was that I had to put my heart into it and be passionate. Um, can we click on some slides? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we've talked about innovation. Right? It's about idea and right, creation. These are just, like I said, it's okay. It's just a few words. Um, but the idea was once you take on the opportunity to, you know, build any business, um, it's very important to be responsible for what you do because there are people dependent on you. My first responsibility came to feed my family, to put food on the table. And that led to starting a business. When you start a business, then you employ people. Then you become responsible to them. Um, you become responsible to the people who support you, like the coach who gave me some uh, goods, or this gentleman who gave me an opportunity to start a business, and then you become responsible to them because they were kind enough to you, so you now have to deliver back to them. So I think responsibility is a very essential part of being an entrepreneur. You cannot walk away from it. It's not something you can say, I'll do today, and because uh, you know, I'm, it's not comfortable for me now that you can walk away from. I find entrepreneurs today that I work with who say, a um, young man comes to me and says, well, I started this company and I'm going to get married. And I say, you can't do two things at the same time, right? And then he, of course, proceeded to have a baby immediately as well. Uh, it just doesn't work. You have to put your heart and mind into the one thing that you have to do. And you have to be committed to making it work. Um, a little story about another thing that an entrepreneur needs, which, of course, I discovered later on. I ride a bike, um, a Harley. And um, after some 20, 30 years of not touching a bike, I came to Chennai and a friend of mine said, why don't you ride with us to Goa? And in my foolishness, I said yes. And so 5 a.m. in the morning with uh, 30 other men, I jumped on this bike with a helmet and a jacket and we rode off towards Goa. And the only thing I uh, requested them was, I said, if I'm scared or if I'm <laughs> not going to be able to do this, someone else has to take over. And they were, of course, like, sure, that's fine. Um, we started off and uh, we reached Bangalore in some 10 hours. And I was like, wow, that's not bad. Uh, I've ridden 600 odd kilometers. We stopped after Bangalore somewhere. And the next day we had to go over the Ghats section into Goa. And of course, that was a different ball game. Um, riding up, didn't realize, and we started taking these curves. And this is like a 500 kilo bike. Right, and uh, I know I look big, but 
handling 500 kilos still wasn't easy. And it's one of those curves that I had to take that I was pulling so hard at the handlebar to take a right turn and the bike wouldn't turn. It just kept going straight through and there's this huge valley on one side and I went off the road. And at that point in time, I realized that the bike was going to go and I had to go with it or I could jump off it, right? Now, of course, my life was far more important. So I had, in that fraction of a second, decided that I would jump off the bike. And the, the minute I decided that something just ca came over me where I became very calm, I knew what I had to do. So I was off the road and shaking away and something, you know, um, unintentionally, just very subtly happened. I started, you know, gearing down without thinking about it. And a few minutes later, uh, I was in first gear and the bike was back in control and I had shifted a little bit and came back on the road. Anyway, the point of the story is not that I went off the road and came back. A little while later, <laughs> a couple of people, uh, so there's a lead and a sweep always in these bike rides. And uh, I refused to drive, ride fast after that. I said, I didn't want to ride, but there was no one else to take it. So everyone else went off and the, the three of us were going. And at, uh, maybe after about half an hour, and we crossed about two kilometers in half an hour, we stopped for a break. And the lead came to me and he says, you know what, Didi, this is something you, I observed. I said, yeah, what was that? He said, you know, when you're taking the turns, you're not looking at the place you want to go. You're looking directly in front of you at the, on the road. You need to look ahead. And I thought that was such a, you know, interesting thought. At that point in time, it actually a applied to what I would do in business. And it was so practical in riding a bike. So, s of course, subsequently, I continued to, when I was taking the right turn, I would look at the point that I had to be. And the whole bike and the body would just lean into it, and I would get to that point without worrying about it. And I reached Goa safely, as you can see. But <laughs> that, that thought remained with me, that one, you need presence of mind. You know, at any point, that challenges are always going to happen when you're an entrepreneur. Um, you can't expect life to be easy. And when those challenges happen, um, the point is to not panic, but to have presence of mind. Stay calm and clear your mind, of unclutter your mind, and start looking at what the solutions are. The second thing is to look ahead. Don't look at the situation you're in at that point in time. You're already in it. There's not much you can do about it. But what you can do is look ahead because then you start finding solutions on how to get out of that uh, situation. So that was an interesting story, but it's a, it's a very key attribute of being a good entrepreneur. Um, presence of mind and looking ahead. Uh, leadership and responsibility are key. The one thing that made it fun for me is to always have passion in what I do. I, I, can, uh, I think I was talking to someone yesterday, said, yeah, I do too many things um, you know, all the time. And someone asked me, so how do you do so many things? I ride a bike, I play cricket, uh, I still continue to play some cricket, uh, play some golf, I um, travel, I run three, four businesses. And I, my answer to them is simple. I don't do so many things. I only do one thing at a time. When I'm riding the bike, that's all I do. I ride the bike. When I'm talking to you right now, that's all I'm doing. I'm not thinking of anything else. I'm talking to you. So staying in the moment and focusing on the problem or the situation in the moment is very valuable to making yourself successful. Um, I know we're running short of time, so I'm going to jump to what I'm doing currently. Uh, a few years ago, three, three and a half years ago, some entrepreneurs came to me and asked me to help. I had decided to retire. And they said, would I help them, you know, look at their business models and help them with funding? And I said, this is a good way of giving back. And uh, so I started Dust Star Ventures. And I'm no megnomaniac. Dust Star is not my last name. Dust is German for the. It's the star. And it's about the idea of creating stars in entrepreneurs. Uh, it just so happened that a couple of my partners who worked with me, our initials form DAS. SAD would have been a very terrible name. <laughs> so, I, so it's called <laughs> The Star instead. Um, the model was created because I wanted to change the way the ecosystem worked. I had fun, uh, built and sold seven, eight businesses in the US where I've lived for 25 years. And uh, the journey of starting a company, raising money, working with VCs and exiting was interesting to say the least. Um, one is you never have as much as you think you should have had by the end of it all, because right now everybody else owns a bigger chunk of your company. And secondly, the journey is not 
you know you don't you don't palm off parts of that journey just because they've given you money you ra- have to do it all so it's mostly a financing option so uh, i try to look at the gaps that there are in the ent- uh, entrepreneur eco- ecosystem and i said is there some way i can fix those that i you know went through as a an on, uh, as an entrepreneur one was getting money that will sustain me till i get to series a right right to the point when i have a business platform that works competence i told you the consequence of the competence landed us to make a choice and the fourth c i would say the most important we wanted to reach back to the community we want to put back to the community and that we did it by supplying vaccines through the universal immunization program for the government of india which means every child born in india gets vaccinated by our vaccines so i would like to say that this long and grinding journey has been gratifying only because we have created ourselves a niche and that niche is wherein we reach the larger masses of the community through various businesses and created an identity that we are the only manufacturer of vaccine bcg vaccine in tamil nadu the second manufacturer in the country and the fourth manufacturer in the globe <laughs> so how did we reach to the community i just have some statistics which i am happy to share because this is my story by being in media we provided entertainment for the entire tamil population in 12 different countries we supply we have supplied so far 1.5 million um bicycles to children going to school this is for school children to enable them to go to school in the remote parts 1857 families have shelter from the tsunami houses infrastructure for the population of three districts because we've laid the roads through contracts 18 mnc's benefited from uh, our documentation for them for participating in their tenders and the entire tamil speaking population of reading the in uk who could read the news at the earliest given point of time because there was no web news happening then i'm talking about 2003 and then to end it 145 million children having been vaccinated with our vaccines Thank you for the opportunity Tycon and ladies and gentlemen gathered here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much ma'am for sharing your wonderful experience and all for also for making us more confident. Thank you so much. And our next speaker of the day is Mrs. Hemalada Annamalai. Mrs. Hemalada Annamalai is the founder and CEO of Ampere Vehicles, a company spearheading India's e-bike revolution. Their products range from e-cycle to e-scooters, e-trolleys for carrying load and special purpose vehicles for waste management and differently abled. Ampere has carved a niche for itself as an innovative technology creator in the nascent Indian electric vehicle industry contributing to environmental sustainability. A serial entrepreneur and a founding charter member of Thai Coimbatore, she has spent the last 15 years creating her ventures and has been in a varied industry spanning professional services electronics travel and automobiles ladies and gentlemen with utmost respect may i invite mrs hemlada annamale for the next session good afternoon all of you i'm sorry to put you all very you know talk when you have a hungry stomach I don't like to talk like that but unfortunately today it has gone very late but I'll try to keep it as uh, precise and as uh, uh, direct as possible now uh, before I start about my journey I just wanted to explain to you that uh, first of all why did I come to manufacturing I just wanted to give you some preview before I talk about uh, uh, go through my slides I have only 10 12 slides um I am basically my mother is a teacher my father is a professor big family five daughters one son i am the fifth daughter okay and uh, first generation entrepreneur rebellious child always wanted to question things okay and i think you know so when your childhood abilities are like that fortunately my parents never stopped us 
See, that's a blessing, you know. know how many families people control, you know, parents control. So I think that's a blessing, I would say. So I think it was such a beautiful thing. And I worked in, uh, finished my engineering, computer science, uh, first batch GCT Coimbatore, then worked in Wipro Bangalore, first job. And then life was very comfortable, got married, settled uh, in Singapore, and then did in my MBA, master's from Australia and all that. You know, this is, I'm, why I'm telling you all this is that, because when life becomes very complacent, very, uh, sorry, very comfortable, you don't want to take risk. And that's where we, we, we as entrepreneurs make the wrong decision. You know, I have a lot of mentors, I'll talk about it, and always my mentors say that, you know, Hema, if you constantly discomfort yourself, okay, from your comfort zone, that's where the growth comes. The struggle is there, but that's where you become solid, isn't it? So I think, um, so uh, I, when I was 27, I became an entrepreneur and I decided that I'm not going to write my CV again. And I just walked it. Okay, today what? Almost uh, 20 years are gone and then uh, five entrepreneurial ventures done. This is my fifth venture and four ventures, all small, small ventures, all done, etc. And then this opportunity came about when in a conference, Toyota CTO ma made a statement he said that gone is an era of IC engine, okay? I didn't know what was IC engine. IC stands for internal combustion engine. And uh, I just, it was just uh, very, uh, you know, intriguing. How can an era of IC go away? I was just comparing India and said that there's so many vehicles of all kinds going in India. How can an era go away? So that was a trigger. And then I uh, uh, started this uh, venture and then uh, came to India in 2007, did some market research and then went back in 2008 and said that I wanted to start it and uh, just got the name Ampere. Ampere is the name of a French scientist who discovered electromagnetism. So all our ventures are based on scientists' name. I think bef bef without them, I don't think you'll have even the electricity. Yeah. So uh, it was incorporated and it was a very uh, gratifying moment, you know, because I think uh, uh, in life, sometimes opportunity comes once, you know, and then when I decided to come here, you know, my mother who was alive then, she said that, you know, Hema, are you sure? Okay, I know that, you know, you want to do many things because this is a venture that no investor would trust, okay, because manufacturing is not preferred at all by any investors, right? Because yesterday you heard, it's saying that it's capital intensive and all that. So, when she said that, you know, are you surely want to come? You have two grown-up girls, you know, it's life is going to be very tough. You've lived in Singapore for 16 years. And if you come here, it's going to be very challenging because it's not straightforward like Singapore and you're going to have all kinds of challenges. But I just said, um, I thought through, I said that no, because I'm not coming here to make money because money was never a factor for us, for me particularly per se. I said that I want to make a difference particularly. Then she asked me what difference you want to make. I said that I want to make a difference because every household in a village, I want them to have a low cost mobility solution through an electric cycle. If we can provide an electric cycle for people, short range communication, I mean, uh, uh, commutation, I mean, 20, 30 kilometers is what they all do every day. And imagine there are so many elders and all that who can't even walk. And they need a very uh, simple solution. So that's the whole uh, context under which this was uh, started. And today, roughly about six years have gone. We are in three southern states. 20,000 vehicles have been sold. We are the uh, company that has got recently recognition by uh, Government of India for our research and development capability. And we have supplied 1,200 scooters for the disabled, uh, winning a big, large tender, beating Hero Electric and TI Cycles Murugappa Group. Why I'm say, telling you all this is that sometimes, you know, when you've decided to do it, nobody can stop you. Simple as that. You know, life is like that. You know, when you've decided to do it, no one can stop. You know, you just have to keep going. Because when we were in a tender situation, they were saying, oh my God, this company is only two years old. They are importing from China, kitting, selling. They don't have service and all that. That's what the competition said. You know, and today, if you look at what Mr. Elum, uh, Mr. Velumani said, he said that if you're going to worry about your competition, you'll never grow. So that's what we did. We never bothered about competition. We said that there is a market, we're going to go for it. Okay, so that's the background. So with that, I'll just start. Uh, can you help me to move this one? Starting trouble, huh? Always. <laughs> this on is it? Not required. Okay, so. Before uh, I go into the slide, I want to tell you that I had to overcome few myths. Huh? So the myths I want to categorize into, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the myth of uh, myths on starting the venture itself, mentors and money. Okay. So what are the myths that I have to overcome? The first myth I have to overcome is that, you know, I already said about women are not suitable for manufacturing. Okay. So, and second myth is India is not conducive for manufacturing. And third one is electric vehicles are inferior to gasoline bikes. Yeah. So, women are not suitable for manufacturing. Who decides that? You decide. 
right simple as that i mean at the end of the day who, who let people tell what they want to tell you want to do it go for it and i always believe that you know there's nothing i also I, i don't celebrate women's day and all that you know because you see if you're born as a woman it's a blessing of god already you received so no need to differentiate between men and women and all that isn't it so uh, the second one is that in terms of you know whether uh, india is not suitable uh, for manufacturing or not because i completely invested my life savings you know life savings of my daughter's education money yeah <laughs> so my husband was telling me are you sure you want to do it i said yes we want to do it so when you're going to take savings and then you're going to plunge it it's purely the gut you know the adrenal gush they say no that has to be there when you want to drive the ventures if you don't have it don't do it okay if you have it go for it fully so when you always try and something do you always want to dream a big dream there's nothing called small dream dream a big dream how does it matter you know so uh, if you look at it india is not conducive yes before now the new government is planning to implement lot of policies national electric mobility mission plan is coming so it should do us good and secondly like i said i wanted to bring manufacturing uh, to villages through e cycles yeah this is a second myth and it's already now we have sold more than about 10000 cycles so we have already done some work in the market yeah and uh, this is the old man who came to our factory he is actually from a village called kodumudi you know he came with a yellow bag and my assistant told me that you know she's uh, come and he wants to meet up with you i was a bit uh, intrigued why he wants to meet up and he said he first came apde you know in in, in tamil you know he come in you know uh, pray he did like this i was very uh, you know you such a elderly person coming and doing it you i was very uh, i get goosebumps you know then i said that enna sir uh, i was asking in tamil talking in tamil that time he was telling me you know madam in our village there are 50 uh, households 10 households are using the cycles okay and uh, it is actually so gratifying if you look at it these cycles are so useful for us in fact i don't allow even my grandchildren to touch my cycle it has helped me so much i don't have any knee po- knee problem at all using this cycle so that is very good so the other factor is that why is india not conducive my question is that if china can consume 30 million electric bikes per year why can't india okay the other factors also is that very amazing factors is that uh, uh, you know i'm i just feel that you know india is too much dependent on five six large petrol players who's in the market why can't it be democratized by capitalized ev industry you know in electric vehicles only four key components battery motor controller charger and if you do that very well and if you know the dynamics of how to design these components you have a very big market who cares about the plastics and the frames that's anyway is available the key core technology is in our hands so i thought maybe we can do something better huh? so third uh, myth that we have to overcome is are electric vehicles inferior to gas i don't think so if it if it was so how could have we sold 20000 vehicles so far in the southern states number one number two is that this was the bike that we designed actually in uh, singapore it's actually going at uh, 80 kilometers per hour and uh, can one charge can get a range of about 100 kilometers okay and uh, we didn't have all the infrastructure but we also outsourced, outsourced many things and we got it done so it is just all these myths were actually finally just busted off okay because you have to just get going yourself yeah and uh, the other thing i talked about three things one is the myth the other one is mentors see tai is all about networking mentoring and education right tai is all about people who are ready able and willing so when i came to coimbatore believe me i am not from this place i don't know anyone there so how did i have to connect to the to the place because a lot of people were son of the soil that they know the market best better because i lived in uh, you know born and brought up in chennai but then uh, lived overseas for almost 16 years when you come here you are almost half singaporean in your thinking so it becomes very difficult so i actually was instrumental to start the tai chapter in coimbatore why did i start the chapter of course ulterior motive because i want to get connections i want to get to the entrepreneurial network yeah but you have to give in you have to work hard to get it right so i did it and then today i'm so happy because that mentoring really has opened up because i also mentor a lot of people and i have two international mentors one is prof hang from singapore and the uh, other one is bala who's my husband okay and uh, both of them are my mentors so it is very nice if they're just at the mentor level <laughs> so prof hang i think uh, is a very very nice person he is a pioneer in disruptive in- innovation of electric bikes so when i wanted to start the venture i didn't know all i know that i want to do it and i was just praying that somebody with money will come and help me and my prayer was answered 
So he came, he said that, you know, Hema, what do you know about the sector and all that? Somebody introduced to him. So speaking to him and he said that this is what I want to do and I wanted to. So he asked me one question. He wanted to see whether I'm a restless entrepreneur who wants to make quickly money and then go back or something like that. So he asked me a question asking Hema, how long do you think that this industry you're going to play in? I said, 20 years. Immediately he said, yes, come see me and became my partner. Because this is not going to be easy industry. I know that for sure, right? Because you're coming in consciously. Of course, my husband is the backbone. He is the technologist giving me all the technical advice. And uh, I think without this support, I don't think I would even uh, be here to you know, uh, share my uh, such a su journey. It was such a uh, you know, very, uh, I, I would say that uh, self-fulfilling. It was a, such a beautiful journey because the family support is there. You know, it becomes so beautiful. And then, of course, my other mentors, stuck again so when you choose you know when you have mentors huh, you should not go and take talk anybody who comes and advise you is not a mentor <laughs> you have to note that because you see you have to choose your mentors i'm telling you you know somebody may see it quite arrogant that's why this lady is saying choosing mentors because if you look at it all these people if you look at hamish and the javari is an investor in a company so investor one said sudeep nandi is actually a market expert he analyzes markets, Shankar Jagannathan, all of them are my friends in Wipro. I work in Wipro, Bangalore, most of them are all from Wipro. And then Shankar Jagannathan is the ex-treasurer of Wipro Corporation. He used to work with Ashim Premji very closely. And Suri Valuri is a marketing specialist. So these mentors really shape you up, you know. Sometimes, you know, when, I'm, when you're stuck, you don't know what to do. You know, one call to the mentor and then they'll sure return your call one. You know, if your mentors do not return your call within 24 by 7, chances are they're not your mentor. Okay? I tell you very, very uh, humbly that... Uh, you know, there are some people who want to align with you because your idea is good. Okay, please very, be wary of such guys. And there are some people who will really come, want to help you scale, understand, etc. You know, I always believe in skilling, scaling, and speed. That's only possible in this, yeah? So I think uh, the, the rest is, uh, the third myth is money. Recently, Ratan Tata was in Bangalore, I mean in Coimbatore, and he was telling that, you know, doing the right thing for the community or the geography is what a leader should be guided by. Five minutes, yeah, sure. So I think um, uh, it is understood. I already told you that if you're driving any venture for money, high chances that you'll not become successful. Okay, take it from me. I've, I've seen it in my life. 99% chances are very, very bleak. And um, priorities, I know this is something that I put the four priorities here when you can see. I think that's how I drive myself. I put family first, of course, health, and then spiritually last is money. So that's why my life is very good because I don't uh, when I want to just go, go off to sleep. I can just sleep immediately. Yeah, so I think the last uh, part, I think it's stuck again. <coughs> so I think the, the value proportion of e-bike is very much, I don't want to go into details. You can just go figure out everything from the website. It's very, very simple. Six to eight hours you charge, you get a run distance of 60 kilometers. Very useful for point to point last mile commute. Okay, today electric vehicles are not the replacement for petrol bikes. Please understand, it is not because we cannot do it. It's because the lithium battery is very costly. Lead acid battery, if it's one, lithium battery will be 3x. So it's very costly, that's why. Otherwise, it, solutions are already available. So it's a lot of myths that you have to overcome. And then, what are the differences that we saw in industry? And when we came here, there has absolutely no ecosystem at all for the industry. So what we did, we indigenized components. We did chargers, we just motors, controllers, ourselves. And then, <coughs> second problem is unproven industry, no funding. So when there's no funding, what should you do? Cut cost, invent innovative frugal engineering. Lot of things we did very frugally, you know, and we're very, very happy that we are able to make solutions you know, work because of this frugal engineering. And third, batteries are the heart of this vehicle. You know, batteries are, we act like battery doctors. Mrs. Jyoti Ashwani is the managing partner of the textile and lifestyle division of the Prestige Lichmandas Group. And the Prestige Lichmandas Group is a family-run group and specializes into FMCG textile retailing and distribution with partnership with several leading players including ITC, Raymond, Amway, Colorplus, Bombay Dying, and a couple of self-started ventures, namely Priceless, The Factory Outlet, and My Kingdom, The Family Lifestyle Store. She is the winner of Women's Achievement Award from Ernaklum Women's Association and is a successful homemaker. Apart from this, she has also been interviewed by various TV channels. So may I invite a moderator of the session, Mrs. Jyoti Ashwani. I feel proud and privileged to be here to welcome dignitaries on and off the dais, the successful entrepreneurs, 
the one of the entrepreneurs i can see quite a few men who are some of them wondering what the hell are these women are up to each and everybody a hearty welcome to all of you it gives me immense pleasure to see that uh, this is the third year of tai where we have got uh, our chief guests coming from all over the world to come and inspire us and i would like to welcome all these chef chief guests who are here with us today but before i do that i would like to say a few words about women entrepreneurship well the new millennium has seen a significant change the attitude of women and society towards women and their role in society towards equality i mean what we see today we find women in board rooms they are uh, prime ministers they are everywhere every which field we find them very very active that gives us the feeling that women are at par with men but if we really look at the bottom we find still quite a few women are suffering and need a lot more to be done to uh, to improve their conditions whether it is health wise or their uh, victimization at home or at work places needs to be improved so ladies and gentlemen i'll not take much of your time i know we are all running very late to encourage and motivate us we have three prominent speakers here with us and i would like to first welcome dr b dakshiani uh, please give her a big round of applause Dr Dakshani is the founder director of Green Signal Bio Biopharma Private Limited Company and she has headed the setting up of World Health Organization pre qualified vaccine manufacturing unit at Gumidipudi right yes. right ma'am yeah for producing bcg vaccine our mc will introduce her in uh, detail so i'll move to the my next speaker since my everybody is looking at me what how much time this woman is going to talk <laughs> Okay our second speaker is a very talented and multifaceted personality Ms Hemalata Hemalata Anna Malai please give her a big round of applause She is the founder and CEO Ampere Vehicle Private Limited and uh, she is uh, one woman who has uh, ventured into the men's field manufacturing area very very non conservative field we are all very eager to listen to you ma'am and uh, last but not the least i would like to welcome ms durga das the founder and managing partner of durga star ma'am uh, durga das star sorry sorry das star so please give her a big round of applause durga das an entrepreneur who will talk about the key attributes of being a successful entrepreneur by sharing with us her personal journey filled with challenges yet fun i also found out one more thing when she is not hitting runs in her business world she is hitting sixes and fours playing with the us women's cricket team not only that an active traveler she can be found taking pictures of uh, lions and uh, in south africa <laughs> or smelling coffee in her resorts in south india and such a wide uh, kind of profile you know we'd love we're all very eager to listen to you ma'am and looking forward to a highly intellectually stimulating and motivating session ahead thank you very much a first speaker for the day is dr b dakshani dr b dakshani have been involved in facilitating technology transfer for vaccines and have coordinated global joint venture products with various international research institute and vaccine centers ladies and gentlemen with huge round of applause let's welcome dr b dakshani the founder director of green signal biopharma private limited company for a session so very good afternoon to all thanks for the introduction yes coming from the manufacturing um, sector of large scale industry I have a long grinding story to tell and yet it is a very gratifying story to share. You must have heard from yesterday to today all the young startups that entrepreneurship is about being innovative. 
you're given an idea and what do you do with the idea so this differentiates you so entrepreneurship is about where you take the idea and at the end of doing the business it could be they call serial entrepreneurs they call multiple entrepreneurs there are a lot of people who have done one business after the other can i have this switched off please very distracting i don't have a powerpoint <laughs> so at the end of all the serial entrepreneurship and the multiple entrepreneurship the product is you entrepreneurship defines you and that is what has been the journey i would also tell for the startups that there is no one formula there is no backward engineering for entrepreneurship um it could be manufacturing like in my case uh, it's a vaccine manufacturing unit you could put up a ma vaccine manufacturing unit i'm not talking about the us or the china or china but i'm just talking if you could put it uh, even in ahmedabad the government setup is different the psychology is different even the water is different for production the air around you is different so maybe the manufacturing process the process of doing the business it's only a thin slice of the cake of entrepreneurship the process could be um emulated simulated matched but then entrepreneurship is in your hands let me just uh, go a little bit back to the future if there are startups sitting here um if i were to be there with all my questions with all anxieties of starting a new business um uh, with a lot of questions with a lot of excitement i have this to say that when i set up the manufacturing unit as a co-founder of course i had an associate the only ingredient that i had was immense confidence of setting up something new something new now where did this confidence come from the confidence came from 7 years of doing trading business it abetted from a uh, however uh, non challenging i would say trading business was it was like a match practice i'm also a cricketer like durga was a senior in her in the state team uh, we played cricket together so trading business was something like a match practice for me now what was the domain ex expertise for a trading business uh, you needed to have a supply demand you needed to identify the supplier and then there was a logistics and then of course the invoicing and the taxing and everything that comes with the setting up of running a business but then what the point i'm trying to make is the domain expertise of even doing a trading company was only 12% in my case it's the soft skills that take you the 88% that came from doing the entrepreneurship came from the soft skills and the soft skills that uh, came from a lot of traveling through sports arts i'm also a painter so done a lot of seminars for art so i urge and encourage every startup um uh, entrepreneur sitting here to hone your skills in not just the business of course everybody is doing business for profit and for me profit is the result i will i will i will just like to take you uh, to that to tell about why i see it as a result i will go back a little and expand on the trading business first it was selling um free commercial time for tv channels i'm talking about 1996 where even uh, that was a lucrative business for a small proprietary company it was a three person office there was a proprietor uh, who owns the company who's now a the, uh, who's now a co-founder in the pharma company and an office boy and i there again the only ingredient that we possessed was yes we can do some business and that was done for the commercial angle of doing business now a little bit about my associate in the business now i describe him as a serial entrepreneur he's younger to me by 10 years but the experience that he had was oceans away uh, he had all these years of work experience he was all of 28 and uh, he started very young 
and more out of need. I'm talking about six years, seven years, eight years. You could just imagine he was already doing business. And why I say that he is a, uh, a serial entrepreneur and a child entrepreneur is that he figured out the game early. Um, he was from a native village and he would have a driver for his uh, bicycle. So he knew in his early teens that he had to delegate. He had the qualities of the CEO. So when I actually got to meet him to do business, what I understood was through all his earlier experience of understanding what business is all about, he had transcended to the stage of why we're doing the business. See, I would like to touch upon this in detail because I was told about this golden circle. In your brain, there are three parts. I'm just trying to take you to the psychology of entrepreneurship because the business part of it, there are many, many people that you could help and Google search can also tell you. And what I'm trying to say is never get deterred in what you're doing when you start up. There is a psychology to being an entrepreneur. The brain has three parts. There is a why of it, there is a how of it, and there is a what of it. Everybody knows when you want to do business, there is an idea smith. You need an idea. You need a good idea to start a business. Now, ideas you can even buy these days. So there is an idea smith, there is a developer, and there is a designer. So the idea smith becomes, why are you doing the business? But developer develops you into as to how you can make the business. And of course, the designer is what the, pro the product, the people want them. What do the people want? So here is the designer with a what of the business. So if you could have, why are you doing this business? For example, if someone started their entrepreneurial dream with making money out of business, you will succeed, but you will stop at a certain stage. But if you had uh, the why of doing the business, what purpose, why am I doing this business, your vision will far surpass the economics from what you started. So going back to my associate, he had a dream, not just a business plan. He had a dream to do. And he inspired me into joining this uh, uh, trading business, sharing his passion. He empowered me. And empowered is not just uh, giving me a position, but it is a feeling empowerment. You get empowered to do something. Do you believe you can do it? Ask yourself. Do you believe you can do it? Do you have the time? knowledge and training to do it. Well, when I asked myself that, um, I had the time, I wanted to do business. The knowledge, of course, I can gain. I was at a time when Google was just coming in, 1996 and 97, Google was God. So uh, training happened hands-on. Training happened hands-on in the sense we traveled 14 countries multiple times in less than three years to handle seven verticals this one business went on to the other so for example we were into media started off with media i was talking about the free commercial time then we were marketing cereals then we got into producing cereals a few of the cereals before the giants came in and then we would uh, even uh, take the cereals to the tamil speaking population around the globe wherever there was a tamil speaking population then you could go sell your cereals so that was one of the verticals then we did institutional sales for bicycle manufacturing company through government tenders. We are associated with the Avon Cycles in Ludhiana. Then government tenders for building tsunami houses. Now tsunami houses were built in the southern parts of uh, India. Then road contracting again through government tenders. Then preparing documents uh, for attending international tenders. There's a lot of documentation and we would uh, actually prepare the documents for companies to attend the uh, tenders. Then we were content providers and paginators for a daily in UK, which was on a principal to principal basis. So it was on a revenue sharing basis. Then of course the trading business I was talking to you about, import of glass syringes, import of primary packing materials, import of vaccine manufacturing materials, and then the technology transfers for manufacturing the vaccines. You needed the seed to start the manufacturing. So only after tasting immense commercial success in all these business did we land on manufacturing through advices from various illustrious people like um, famous scientists, inventors in US, 
uh, managing directors from 100-year-old research institutes, exporters of manufacturing equipments for pharma, particularly vaccine. And they had all advised us to promote a company and set up a manufacturing unit for vaccines as the world was all set for the boom in the biotechnology. I'm talking about 2002 with India poised as the destination. Yesterday we heard in the inaugural session about the agricultural entrepreneurship. So India is again poised for a 80 agricultural technology in the years to come. So we started our homework in 2002 and we set up a CGMP compliant vaccine unit. CGMP is current good manufacturing practice. So while all other earlier businesses were done for commercial boundaries, commer uh, stretching the commercial boundaries, the manufacturing unit for vaccine was set up with a vision to provide affordable preventive medicine of the killer disease, TB, to the poorest of the poor with a mission statement, wellness for all. Why I'm saying this, the money that we had from all the business, we could have just invested in real estate and made our money. But that is the beauty of entrepreneurship. You venture, you dare, and then it defines you.